Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back. And uh, please go with um, our first speak. First speaker in this session is uh, Thomas from Texas University. Uh, Thomas, please introduce yourself and, and so talk. Thank you. Can you unmute yourself? Oh, no. Now it works. I just got an error message like popping up. I can't unmute myself. It's like, okay. <laughs> we were, I was keeping everyone in suspense. Yeah, no, thanks. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that was my bad. Sorry. Sorry. Okay, let me share my screen uh, first. Okay. Let's see. Let's see side. Okay, um, thank you everybody for coming, uh, for, for listening to us. Uh, it's a really a great meeting. I really have enjoyed everything so far. It's, um, and so for the next kind of 15 minutes, I just wanna give a brief rundown on um, galactic binaries and uh, what we do on the EM side and how can that aid what Lisa will see in the future. And so I really just call this talk kind of Lisa, Lisa meets Gaia. And so let me start with my kind of my favorite plot. I always show this just for the sake of, because I like it so much, um, the, the frequency uh, strain plot. And you see that the, the dominant sources are kind of the bread and butter for Lisa. Um, that will be galactic binary. So right, this is these purple dots here. We all have seen that. But I, I want to actually emphasize one, one point, and that's different, very different from what LIGO is seeing and so on. Lots of these sources, actually almost all of them, won't be tripping within Lisa, within Lisa lifetime. So you won't see any kind of change in the frequency, which means then that there's this degeneracy between the trip mass and the distance, right? So, so that's, that's one of the things we have to think about when we think about these galactic binaries, okay? So that's something, something to keep in mind. So when we talk about these, these uh, Lisa binaries, um, especially regarding the distance, in 2018, when, when Gaia released, that their second data release actually, when parallaxes were released, this was the first time we actually received or got distances uh, for a really large number of sources. Um, and so that's something where we, for the first time, actually try to calculate characteristic strains. And that's a plot, which is from our, our 2018 paper, where at that point, where what we call these verification systems or uh, sources basically, which are SNR5 or higher um, above for Lisa and using these distances from Gaia. So let me say a few things about, about these 2000, 2018 sources. At that point, I don't think there has been really a, a systematic study to find these sources in a, in, a, in a large scope. And so most of these sources you see here were purely serendipitous discoveries, right? Just falling out of a survey, like HM Kangri is uh, the five minute binary source system, which was actually detected first as an X-ray source. And then only follow-up observations show this is actually a compact, a compact system. And so at that point, th there's a strong overabundance in what we call AMCBN systems, which are accreting white walls. A uh, theory not necessarily predicts that, right? We would expect much more double white walls, which are shown here in red. At that point, the number of known sources were much more biased towards the AMCBNs, which is really um, due, to the, due to the fact of how they were discovered. So that was what 2018 was. Well, let me now show you or go slowly towards what we what we now know. And uh, first, we have done much more work on trying to find them more systematically, right? There has been now several surveys, and I just want to give a brief overview of one of them because I was part of that, which was a survey with the Swiggy Transit facility where we really tried to find these, these sources in a much more systematic way and where we focused on specific parts of the, uh, of the galaxy, especially the galactic plane, and observed this, this part of the sky repeatedly uh, with a very high cadence and then really looked for short period variability. So okay, kind of what we did was we went to a field, which is shown here in these squares. We observed this field repeatedly for over two or three hours. And then we looked for changes, periodic changes on this, on, and within these two or three hours. And everything which changes within two and three hours is potentially a very compact system detectable for Lisa. Everything which is not changing on this, on this time frame. Um, it's probably something else. So that was a survey specifically to find these sources. And that actually started in 2018. 
it's actually uh, was ongoing for a few years, and I think it's still it's still ongoing. And by now, uh, this plot is actually a bit old already. This is uh, stuff we, I published in this paper, but by now, actually, the entire galactic plane is filled, and uh, we have a lots of stars. And it's really now a needle in a haystack search to find the short period systems out of these few hundred million individual sources. And that's a whole different topic to so not go into. But over the time, we actually um, have found a few more sources. And uh, just to give you two examples here, one of them is actually a new type of systems, which we have not seen before, where you have a helium star, an SDB star, with a white dwarf in a very compact system, uh, where they actually the helium star has started mass transfer onto the white dwarf. And another thing is, uh, on the right, you see um, this is actually a 24-minute double white dwarf uh, published by Kevin Birch. And you see these little dips down here. Uh, these are actually eclipses. So this is a double white dwarf with, uh, with a period of 24 minutes, and we see this from the eclipses. And you also see here why these high cadence uh, data are so important, because uh, right, these eclipse durations are like one minute or even less, and you really have to kind of stay in the field to exactly get this one minute ex ex eclipse time. But that has not been the only survey. There has been lots of work over the last uh, kind of four years and even before where people have tried to find these. And I just want to give a few examples here. Uh, outlining here. Um, the, the, I think the other big one is the, what we call the extremely low mass white dwarf survey. And I, I want to make a kind of a shout out to my, my postdoc in my group, Kev, uh, Alexander Kosakovsky, who is actually doing this work in the Southern Hemisphere. And they are also looking for these double white dwarfs, but they're looking especially, particularly for extremely low mass white dwarfs um, because they have to be formed in binary. And then TESS, SDSS5, had already contributed one source. And so over the last few years, there has been much more work on finding these sources much more systematically. And before I show you now the new uh, the new updated strain blot and, and uh, some, some inferences from that, let me uh, show you quickly, briefly, uh, how we actually get to these distances. Because keep in mind, when Gaia releases the data, it's parallaxes. Parallaxes is not a distance, okay? So parallaxes is a measurement. And well, you, naively you could say, well, it's just one over the parallax gives you the distance. That's only true if you have a really precise parallax. If the dist, if the parallax is known to much better than 10%, um, then you, you have can do that. But what we have done is actually try to be a bit more sophisticated. What we have done is uh, we actually tried to use base theorem, so kind of a prior knowledge on the volume density and the scale height, and then basically use that to infer the distance. And so what we did is we uh, estimated the population of the sources. So are they particular thin disk, thick disk, or halo. And based on that, we used the prior on the scale height, which we know pretty well now from Gaia, 400 parsec for the thin disk and about 800 parsec for the thick disk, applied that prior and then used that to get the distance. It will not have a strong effect on, on sources which have a very high precision on the distance, but it has an effect on the sources which have a, have a low um, um, precision on the distance. And so doing that, that's how the way we actually just uh, derived our distances. Um, and then the change in particular from Gaia, Gaia DR2 to EDR3 is actually quite, so quite significant. Uh, the parallaxes have improved by something like 20 to 30 percent, as you can see here, um, especially on the faint side where the dark sources, so the fainter sources are, you really see this is the one-on-one -on -one, and then it's 10 percent better, 20 percent and 30 percent better, and you see that especially on the faint side, uh, 30 percent better parallaxes um, leads to much better precision on the distance, and then in turn uh, leads to much better precision on the trip mass. And so that's just to keep in mind. So, so this is where we were 2018. I explained you now a few surveys we have done. Other people have done basically the way we derived the distance, and that's where we stand as of today. So these are the published sources as of today, and we're really building up um, the sources now. So while we took decades to build that um, diagram, we have now within four years more than, double, more than double the number of systems. I also want to say this, these discoveries are now much more systematic. So people specifically look for that kind of stuff. And you already see that. The filled symbols are uh, eclipsing sources, right? And so eclipsing sources are easier to find in the, in the photometric variabilities. And that's why we see an overabundance of eclipsing sources now compared to what we probably would predict. And that also means that, yes, we find more systems. Yes, we are more systematic but the, the, the current population is still very biased. So that's something always to keep in mind. We're getting better, but we are still very biased. And I think we are not quite there yet to do, especially from the photometric sources, um, um, population predictions from the observational side. But we're getting much better and we're finding much more sources. 
but to see to show you how biased we actually still are where if you look at the sky distribution most sources are located in northern hemisphere that's just because surveys are mostly northern hemisphere you see that this is kind of the equator and then everything up to the north is the northern hemisphere to the south the southern hemisphere and so here in the northern hemisphere it's mostly then sdss and ctf and all the sources surveys who find the sources and that's why they are all located there in the southern hemisphere it's still quite empty we have a few of the amcvns from historic surveys or older surveys and then a few smaller things which are actually now coming out of the elm survey and so there's a lot of work being done also now starting in the southern hemisphere and then also in the future black gem where rubin observatory dr4 will provide photomet photometry across the sky will certainly help in the south and over the time will probably we do a much better job building up a sample across the entire sky um, to find these systems. So, so that's kind of um, where we are with the sky location. And so now to put another point on why we are so biased is this is now an HR diagram where we can now put, put these sources because we have the distance on an HR diagram. And you see, this is kind of the main sequence, right? This very dark region here. Then this is the white wolf sequence and all these sources are above. And that's easy to explain from a observational point of view because the bright sources are the ones we see, the bright sources are the ones which are easier to detect. It's just that simple. We have the helium stars SDB up here, with, and then we have the AMCVNs, the accreting AMCVNs here, and then we have the, the, the white wolves here, but none of them actually lies on the white wolf track. And I would probably guess that most of the LISA predictions, LISA sources would probably be on the white wolf track, but that's not what we see. And that's purely observational bias. Uh, because these sources are brighter, so they're easy to detect. But the good news is we're building up a sample. I think we are now close to 30 um, with an SNR of five. Um, and then we have really high SNR sources above 100, close to 10 now, right? So we are getting really there to find these high SNR sources. And so there's a, a GitLab, which actually uh, Valeria started. And um, we're trying to keep this up to date as possible, where we list these, what we call verification systems. Um, these sources, which are SNR five and up, um, roughly. So we have this, this there. So let me know if you're interested. So I have a few more minutes, four minutes, something like that, and I want to spend a bit more time, kind of just introducing something. When we see this plot, when we have this SNR five source, well, it's nice that we see that. And I learned yesterday actually there, just because we know the frequency, already helpful for the global fit. But what can we really? learn in the end what can Gaia what can Lisa add to that or perhaps add something which we don't get from EM right so there's these kind of ideas of how can they aid each other and I think that's something really we're thinking about over the next years also where EM might want to focus on over the next few years to make sure we are really ready for when um, Lisa produces data and that's something also the astrophysics working group and Kaisen Elemans is leading that work trying to figure that out and do this kind of work. So, so and from now, I just want to show a few examples of work I have done with Tyson Littenberg on particularly the AMCVN systems. The AMCVN systems just are very close to my heart. I did my PhD on them. I really like them. And so, but the issue is that a lot of them show mostly accretion disk signatures in the, in the electromagnetic band. So we don't, it's very hard for us to learn much more from the electromagnetic bands because they are very much dominated by the accretion disk. But what, what if, if Lisa can does observe them? And let me say, this is kind of the golden sample. This is, this is when I saw this, this is really awesome. AMCVN itself um, has an expected SNR of more than 100 after four years. It has a 1% level parallax uh, uh, precision on the parallax, so really precise. Uh, this is kind of really the gold standard. And if you put that in and say, what can Lisa give us? It's really mind blowing because we get a 1% level precision on the chirp mass and we can have 10 degree of precision on the inclination. That's something we not even close we can from EM. So that's really, really cool. And that's something I really look forward. So for those sources, I would argue, just try to find them and wait <laughs> and maybe work somewhat on, on getting the primary mass then to solve the chirp mass, but overall, Lisa will give it all to you. If you look to a bit, little bit lower SNR sources, um, 1908 is an example, which is also an accreting AMCVN system. As an hour, roughly like a few tenths after 48 years. Parallax is still precise, but not as precise. And here, the inclination is not as, as the inclination will probably still remain uncertain with Lisa, right? So, this is a, um, a prediction um, from Tyson where he says, well, it's, it's probably uh, uncertain. And so, these are different assumptions on the chirp mass. 
uh, because uh, we think we were thinking about can we actually distinguish donor masses um, in these systems and if you assume different trip masses well if you have a higher trip mass of course you have a higher SNR you get a better precision but still it's not it's not great um, but there are evolutionary idea models which are either these systems move in or move out and so they give different trip masses and to a certain degree you can distinguish different trip masses so I think there's not a lot of it's not completely hopeless but it will be less precise. But here I would argue, well, try maybe to get a better idea of the inclination from the ground or a better idea on the trip mass, and then vice versa, you will help Lisa, right? If you know the inclination to really precise values, well, that actually then nails down the trip mass pretty well, right? So here I would say we should probably try to do a bit more work to get either the trip mass or the inclination better from the electromagnetic observations. And so as the last point, as the last slide, I just wanna give kind of a shout out and, uh, and an advertisement to a, a work done uh, of, of one of my former students, Anton Amabert, who actually finished uh, Texas Tech as an undergrad, and he's now starting a graduate program at SMU with Krista Smith. So he's going to the more massive black holes. And he has done a work on the ultra complex X ray binaries, which is kind of the equivalent, but with a neutron star black hole accretor. And uh, there is the same issue. We know them, we know where they, where they are, we know the period for some, some of them. We know the distance to many of them because they are often in global clusters, but we don't really know the masses or we, without assumptions. And so he has done the work on trying to um, predict what Lisa will actually do for us. And I encourage you to watch, watch his pre-recorded talk to learn more about that. And with that, uh, thank you and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Thomas. And, uh, and now it's time for question. Please raise your hand. Oh. Yes. I, uh, I can't find the button to raise my hand, but I, I do have a question. Uh, you mentioned something about the eclipsing systems on your, your plot. Um, and I was just, uh, this isn't technical, uh, just the lines through, is that to define them? Is that they are eclipsing or is that the error bar? I was just no, slightly sorry, confused. Sorry. Sorry, I had probably should have done that. Yeah, so the line through is the error bar, the predicted error bar based on the distance, based on the mass and uncertainties. And then the filled circle is like filled means that it's eclipsing. So we have a large overabundance of eclipsing sources, which is purely due to the detection method. So filled symbols mean eclipsing. Okay. Uh, I, I, I perhaps missed that because I was yeah. busy with other things. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And uh, Katis, please unmute yourself. Um, this is lovely. I'm so excited to see many more sources. Um, can you talk a little bit about the other detection strategies? Are these, are all of the not filled double white dwarfs from like radio velocities? Is there any yeah. astrometry and are people looking for them in Gaia DR3 now? Um, yeah, yeah, so exactly. Let me actually go maybe back to that slide. So the extremely low mass white dwarf survey, what they do is very different. They actually, extremely long mass white dwarfs have a very specific color. So they do a color selection plus a, a parallax selection, and then they do radio velocities. So that's mostly radio velocities. And so there you are also sensitive to the non-eclipsing sources. And so that's a different detection method. And that's also mostly the, the non-eclipsing sources are often, they're actually from the ELM survey. Um, but yeah. And then on the astrometry, um, well, <laughs> I, I don't think they would necessarily show up in the astrometry because they're too compact. So Gaia wouldn't see them as astrometric binaries. Um, I think that- Yeah, I guess even if they're close enough, they're probably so close I, that we would have already seen I think them. The other, the other hope is, and I actually have not seen anything, but I hope somebody works on that, is the X-rays. Uh, Erosita should uh, produce, right. should see all the HM countries in the galaxy. Um, so the X-rays is another way, I think, which is promising with Rosita as this big survey now running or kind of paused now, but they have two years of data and there should be plenty to look for, for these okay. direct impact accretors on the short period side. So I think these are the main methods, I would say. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Kathy. And uh, Elena, you are next. Please unmute yourself. Hi, Thomas. Thank you for your talk. Um, uh, I was wondering, um, I think you didn't say that, but, but in your study of a very high 
uh, signal to noise uh, um, ratio CVs. Uh, yeah. Are you also looking at deriving the properties of the angular momentum transfer uh, yeah. looking at F dot? Yeah, so that's something, that's a good point because that's something we should be able to. So the hope is if, if we can measure the P dot from over the next 10 years, which I think is not completely out of place, which should be basically outwards moving, so not going in, but going out. And then we get the chirp mass with a very high precision. We know exactly the difference and we know exactly what, what uh, basically the, the astrophysical P dot should be. And then going from that, we can say something about the, about the, the angular momentum transfer. I don't think F double dot is something at least not for AMC again itself. I think HM Kangri, there we have hope because it's so compact. Uh, there, there we have hope. But for AMC again, I, I might be wrong. I'm not a gravitational wave physicist, but I would think the hope is using P dot from, the, from EM versus the chirp mass, and that gives us the astrophysical. Yeah, cor correct. It, yeah, it, it, it's exciting. Yeah, yeah, this is super exciting when I saw this. Uh, next question is uh, Tyson. Yeah, please unmute yourself and ask question. Yeah, it's I'm more just piling on the last question. So, yeah, uh, I think we made these plots. Yeah, your purple and green plots where it's going the other way. Where if you end up with this really nice chirp mass constraint, that yeah. becomes a constraint on how much of the p dot is coming from gravitational waves. And so even if the LISA or follow-on measurements are consistent with no P dot, it at least gives you a, a P dot budget of how much is coming from gravitational waves and then therefore how much must be coming from astrophysics. Right, yeah. And then uh, your, talk, your discussion about inferring the distance from the parallax is more complicated than just one over parallax. I think I was talking to you when I learned uh, that parallax parsec is uh, one arc yes. second of parallax. Uh, exactly. You right. learn, but I, I would find because I'm an idiot, as I just explained, uh, I would find it really instructive to see the inferred distance as a function of one over parallax, so you can see where those things start to diverge. Just yeah. for I know, can, my own yeah. sort of intuition building. That's a that's an easy plot to make. Uh, I haven't like just. Yeah, from doing this, I think it's about when ten percent. But yeah, this is an easy plot to make. I yeah, this is this is a good point. Yeah, because the the reality is once the parallax becomes really too uncertain. So if if kind of the uncertainty is at the level of the parallax, well then you're kind of getting the distance based on your prior. So you really then kind of dominated entirely by the prior, and that's right. I mean, you can only only do so much to infer the right prior, correct prior. So there's always this issue if you are too uncertain, then well, it's it's in the end what you assume, that's what you get, kind of. So but most of these sources are not that bad. Okay, I think we have on uh, no, no more question, and that's thanks Thomas. And uh we go into the next speaker is um Valadias from the University of Bimiham, and as you can talk about the, the last magnetic class from the new perspectives from LIGO, from Lisa. Thank mm -hmm. you. So let me uh, set up everything. Okay. Uh, okay, so with LISA, we will enter in an era of non-transient gravitational wave astronomy by observing the stellar mass compact object binaries that we were talking about until now. And as Tom um, uh, highlighted in the first talk, this will merge on the time scales uh, between thousand and million years. Um, and so they are not going to be evolving within LISA. So although we are often, uh, you know, think of LISA as LIGO, uh, I can argue that uh, LISA will actually seize the sky uh, through these uh, uh, binaries in the same way uh, as Gaia will see. 
But of course, uh, you know, unlike Gaia, we won't have any dust extinction that makes a life of electromagnetic observatory, uh, uh, observers um, uh, difficult. And uh, in my talk, I would like to draw your attention on this, uh, on one of the brightest spots on, on the sky, uh, which I'm sure you recognize to be the Large Magellanic Cloud. And uh, recently Gaia has shown us that the LMC is a very important player in our uh, Milky Way ecosystem. Uh, and that all accurate dynamical studies of our galaxy cannot be done without including the LMCs in fact. So uh, we are sort of living in the LMC renaissance uh, thanks to Gaia. So from the LISA perspective, this galaxy is also interesting because it is the most massive of the Milky Way satellites. It is nearby and it is actively forming stars. And as such, it will likely host a large number of detections. And we can study those gravitational wave LISA sources in a completely different environment to our Milky Way. Uh, so this is how um, I believe the, 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 Lisa, uh, the Lisa sky will, uh, will look like. And in uh, red and yellow here, you see the density per square degree of uh, the famous double white dwarf binaries that uh, uh, we expect to be the most abundant among the, among the other uh, double compact objects uh, accessible to Lisa. And uh, on this map, you also see some uh, stars and, uh, and dots. And this represents uh, represent known uh, Milky Way satellites. So in a paper led by Eleanor Rober here in Birmingham, we studied um, Lisa sensitivity to a fiducial source in each of these uh, uh, known satellite galaxies. And we did this study based on the, you know, rigorous Bayesian detection and parameter estimation uh, techniques. So here the stars are those satellites uh, in which our fiducial source has been detected and the shades of blue uh, for those stars are telling you about the um, uncertainty on the sky localization at the, for, 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 the, uh, for our fiducial source. So the question I would like to address next is how likely uh, our fiducial source uh, is, uh, uh, is likely to be uh, in the Milky Way satellites and there will be enough of these sources um, for the satellites to stand out against uh, the galactic uh, double white dwarf uh, foreground. Uh, and we can answer this question using binary population synthesis model. So here I'm using the one from Sylvia Tonen uh, that is constructed based on the code called SIBA. And here uh, you are looking at the uh, orbital period chill path parameter space. And in color, I'm also showing you the, the time it takes for the binary uh, to evolve from the zero age main sequence to the, to the double white dwarf stage. So of course, as you may expect, the, the more massive binaries uh, evolve uh, faster. And as we go lower uh, down uh, with the mass, then this, the, the double white dwarf formation time scales become uh, you know, longer and longer uh, to the point to be comparable with the age of the galaxy. Uh, one uh, tiny detail I wanted to mention. So this specific model uh, is based on the, well, is fine-tuned and based on the uh, observed double white dwarfs. So uh, it's also uh, reproduces well the um, observed uh, space density that we measure from spectroscopic samples. And it also um, matches well the, uh, the mass ratio distribution that, um, of these binaries that, uh, uh, that is shown to, to peak at around unity. So now we uh, take this population and we place it at the position of the satellite. And we inject our binaries uh, at the rate uh, that is dictated by uh, star formation history. So here I'm using uh, some examples. Um, and let me, uh, without going uh, much into detail, show you the, the results. So in this plot, uh, we are looking at the number of detections in color as a function of the satellite uh, stellar mass uh, and the distance from us. Uh, and we repeat this study for different um, uh, 
star formation histories, IMF, metallicities, as, and so on. So this is just one, uh, one illustration, one simulation. Uh, and it tells us basically, if we look at this dashed uh, uh, thick line uh, that is showing us the one uh, detection uh, contour that satellites with the total stellar mass higher than a million uh, solar masses can host uh, LISA detectable double, double white dwarf. And if the satellite is located within a couple of uh, hundred kiloparsec, uh, these double white dwarfs can actually be detected uh, by LISA. So I'm uh, overplotting here a few uh, famous satellites, uh, but uh, you can see that LMC, uh, so the Large Magellanic Cloud, is our uh, primary target, so it, uh, it uh, uh, is expected to yield uh, the most uh, uh, LISA detections. So with the former master student at Leiden Observatory, uh, Michael came, we uh, follow up uh, on, on this idea. And uh, Michael thought about uh, uh, a few models, um, few realistic models for the LMC, in which we, uh, you know, look at the star formation, we look at the spatial distribution, and we also vary the mass. Uh, and just by um, at the end, by comparing uh, the the outcome of our simulation, we also want to assess how these uh, ingredients, you know, influence the the, the the detectability of, of these binaries with LISA. So our first model is the observation driven one. Uh, and we call it like this because we are using a spatially resolved um, a star formation history constructed by uh, the, um, Harry Senzaritsky. And this is based on 20 million stars observed with the uh, Magellanic Cloud Photometric Survey. So with such a large uh, number of stars, you can actually dissect uh, the LMC as was done here and for uh, in these tiny pixels. And for each of those, you can, you know, fit uh, stellar models, derive uh, stellar ages and build the star formation history. So uh, in this model, we uh, inject our binaries in this uh, um, 2D pixels. Uh, according to the star formation uh, history of the pixel and the number of injected binaries per pixel is given by the integral of the star formation rate that is the, the, uh, that give us the total mass of stars uh, in that pixel. So here on the right you see our version of, of the LMC based on this uh, um, study. Uh, uh, in our second model, uh, that is the simulation driven, we wanted to explore more uh, the spatial um, distribution of the LMC and its peculiar features that are uh, that I'm mentioning here on the, on the slide. So the bridge between the Magellanic clouds, then the, the arms extending towards the SMC and towards us. And we uh, wanted to see whether these are visible with LISA. So this is, uh, so here we are, uh, we base our study on uh, antibody hydrodynamical simulation of Scott Lucchini uh, that was specifically designed to, to reproduce this uh, um, LMC features. And here we inject our um, double white dwarf population into the simulation particles according to the particle mass uh, and the age of, of the stars within it. And again, on, on the right, you see uh, our version of the, um, of the LMC based on this model. Uh, and the third model is actually the combination of the best features of, of these two. So we took the um, obser uh, observed uh, LMC star formation history and we combined it with the spatial distribution from, the, uh, from this um, hydrodynamical simulation. So first, let me show you the, uh, the double white dwarf formation rate as a function of time for the first two models. So the, uh, the, the observation based one is in blue and you see that the formation of double white dwarfs is pretty shallow until six, seven giga year. And then we have a, a big jump and another jump um, 
uh, of star formation that is believed to be triggered by the interaction with the SNC. Uh, while uh, this is the, the gray line is the simulation driven model in which you know you see that the um, most of the binaries are formed within the first few uh, giga years and there is very little star, star formation since. So our combined model by, uh, you know, by construction is then uh, um, in terms of the formation history follows more closely uh, model one that you see here, but there are some differences due to the different mass distribution. Um, so let me show you the result um, in terms of the number of double white dwarfs as a function of the uh, LMC total stellar mass. So on the top, we are looking at double white dwarfs emitting in the Lisa band, and you see that, uh, that the number scales linearly uh, with, the, with the stellar mass of the LMC. And the three models predict roughly similar numbers all around 20 million binaries. Uh, but when we look at the LISA detectable binaries here on the bottom, you see that the, the uh, model one and three, so based on the observed star formation history, yield uh, from uh, a couple to several times uh, more LISA detectable binaries than the one uh, based on on the simulation, and the uh, the reason is uh, is within the star formation history. So, uh, so uh, more recent star formation yields more uh, laser detectable binaries. And what we have learned from this plot that while the uh, st total stellar mass of the LMC sets the, the total number of binaries emitting at the millihertz frequencies, the star formation history sets the quality in terms of detectability with LISA uh, for these binaries. Uh, so very quickly, I want to show you the breakdown of detectable binaries in, in some categories. Uh, so this is for the set mass of the 2.7 billion solar masses. We have uh, um, the range uh, in total uh, between a few hundred to several hundred double white dwarfs, of which from 50 to 60% are detached, and the remaining 50 40% uh, may be in the interacting phase. And importantly, I want to highlight this last category. Um, uh, uh, that uh, selects binaries with total stellar, ma uh, total stellar mass higher than the Chandra Sekar limit. So uh, this uh, will be exploding in the future as supernova type 1As. And uh, this is very special category because, uh, um, you know, we haven't discovered not even one uh, a supernova type 1A progenitor in our galaxy. So LISA will be um, a crucial instrument for finding this. And we show that uh, uh, it will able to do that not only in the Milky Way, but also in the LMC. Again, uh, here I'm showing you instead the distribution of the binary orbital period and the chirp masses. And I would like to highlight uh, this um, vertical lines that show you the, the means of the respective distributions. And again, the blue and the yellow, so the models based on the observed star formation history uh, sort of overlap, and the, the gray line um, uh, differs a little bit. So this blue and yellow lines fall um, at larger orbital periods and higher um, chirp masses. And that's again uh, related to the star formation history because with the more uh, recent star formation uh, history, we have more massive binaries uh, that typically also sits at larger um, orbital periods. So this can be a signature of the you know, LMC uh, star formation, um, uh, past star formation history. And finally, I would like to mention that we will also uh, uh, learn uh, about the LMC's total mass if we uh, reverse engineer our model uh, models and uh, starting from the observed number of detections, you know, we can look at, the, at, the, at the, our library of models uh, that predicts the number of detections per solar mass while we also vary the age, the distance, star formation history, and so on. 
and we can, you know, uh, infer in a Bayesian way the mass that had uh, that was necessary to generate uh, the observed number of detections by Lisa. So here I'm showing you example in which we um, of the posteriors on uh, uh, total stellar mass and the distance in which we used uh, for the inference a star formation history that is uh, close to the um, to the ob observed one. So for this two model, we were able to um, correctly recover the total stellar mass uh, with the uh, more or less 20, 40% uh, precision. So since I'm running out of time, uh, I'll just uh, quickly skip to the summary. And basically let me tell you that uh, we are now li living uh, in the times in which LMC is an active topic uh, of research. However, all studies so far relied on electromagnetic observations where LISA will provide us a new promising avenue for synergetic and independent studies of population of stellar remnant binaries. Now, this is formed uh, in a different environment to our galaxy, and we will be able to do this with the, you know, multiple instruments that I'm, as I'm showing you here in a, in a multi-messenger fashion. And uh, from the LISA detection, we will also be able to learn about the LMC's mass content and star formation. And this results, this constraint will be based on completely different selection effects and thus they will be important to include for, um, uh, you know, uh, joint uh, constraints with electromagnetic observations. And I'll stop here. Thank you, Valeria, for the talk. And, um... Yeah, uh, and I saw we have uh, several hands right here. At first, it's um, Antonia. Please uh, unmute yourself. Uh, no, and... Uh, he might have been hands of applause. Mm -hmm. um, it was a very good talk. Um, maybe you could just comment. I, I don't have figures and values in front of me, but um, just how unfeasible or feasible is it to see any of these um, systems optically? And maybe, well, perhaps Thomas could comment on that, but um, I'm just wondering if, given that we know roughly how far away the, the Large Magellanic Cloud is, maybe we can, yeah, it so helps curtain its distance. Yeah, so it's 50 uh, kiloparsec away, so that's quite a lot for the dim uh, stars like like white dwarfs. However, if they are accreting, uh, as I'm sort of like uh, showing here uh, in, with the stars, you now they uh, uh, we can see the X-ray emission produced by accretion, and uh, so you can see them, for instance, with the uh, uh, with the X-ray telescopes. Uh, so that's uh, is very promising multi-messenger way of uh, you know combining gravitational waves and electromagnetic ways for, for the LMC. Okay, and uh, yeah, next one, Thomas. Yeah, sorry, you might have said it. My internet is acting up a bit, so I might have missed it if you said it. But I was wondering exactly about the uh, Athena detection. So how, I saw you had this nice big blob of <laughs> signals, but for a given source, for especially the interacting source, um, how how uncertain or how certain is the how big will be the error circles roughly within the LMC and will they be completely just a big blob and undistinguishable or do you think yeah. you can pick out individual sources especially if Athena gives you then a frequency maybe you can identify individual sources yeah so I I have a slide on on the error bars that I uh, had to skip but basically the sky localization will be of a sub degree square uh, yeah, that's good. and for yeah, so actually that's smaller than the LMC itself. <laughs> so we yeah. will be able to, you know, say that, that those binaries are there. And in addition, LMC also sits in a quiet, uh, not populated part of the sky. So that yeah. also helps to, uh, you know, to uh, associate them. Uh, yeah. I don't remember Athena's field of view, but uh, I hope, uh, you know, um, uh, it is the, the the Lisa errors may not be so bad for for the synergies. That's cool. That's that's really cool. 
Okay. Uh, thank you, Thomas. And the next question came from Alexander. Hi, Valeria. Uh, great talk. Um, I, I was really cool to see the, the mass measurement. So the that second model that you had, the, the different star formation history, you might have mentioned this, but can you explain why that results in a lower number of detectable sources? My like naive thought would be that if you have more systems forming earlier, more systems should be at higher frequencies, so we should be better at detecting them. Yeah, so um, I don't think I have a, a good plot for this in here, but basically, um, when uh, with this, um, uh, with the recent star formation, you uh, add binaries at all uh, orbital periods, and um, you add also binaries close or directly in the, in the Lisa band, and this uh, brings also the the more massive. Yeah, maybe this. This also brings uh, uh, more massive binaries that in the old population, um, they would have already evolved. So this is why, for instance, mm -hmm. the, the chirp mass distribution is uh, slightly different when we have the, let's say, young, younger population uh, and the older population. So you, you bring into binaries that are um, more detectable and the, the star, like adding binaries via star formation is more uh, more efficient in terms of LISA detections versus uh, putting them all at the same time and waiting for them to evolve uh, uh, by a gravitational wave radiation because in this way you lose these massive binaries because they just merge very quickly. Yeah. That makes a ton of sense, thank you. Okay, and I think that it's the last question for Valeria. And let's thank Valeria again. And uh, we can move on to the, the last speaker. Katis, are you ready? Yes. So, yeah, the last speaker for our today is uh, Katis. She can talk about the applying the metallicity dependent binary fraction to double white rock formation and how is the implication for Lisa. And Katis, please go ahead. Okay. So I should be sharing my front page of my screen and I can see my presenter notes. Great. Okay. So um, thanks to all the speakers in this session so far. It's been absolutely lovely and fantastic to learn about all of this new exciting science. Um, today I'm going to be presenting the results of some work that was led by Sarah Thiel, who was a student that worked with me while I was at CETA. Um, and she is not giving this talk today because she is presently figuring out a move from the University of British Columbia, where she did her undergrad um, to Princeton for grad school. Um, so she said she couldn't be here, but sends her regards. <laughs> um, so in this project, uh, we uh, tried to take into account some new understanding of um, zero age main sequence populations, namely metallicity dependent initial binary conditions, combined that with um, a very precise uh, set of metallicity dependent positions and ages from the latte suite, specifically um, the M12i galaxy from the latte suite of the fire simulations, and then some binary evolution models um, with cosmic. So throughout this talk, um, I'll walk you through each of those things um, to then show what we um, have found in terms of what Lisa will see based on uh, including a metallicity dependent binary fraction on the zero edge main sequence. So first, let's talk about um, what observations we found. Um, so it's becoming more and more uh, stable at this point. There's really a host of uh, results coming out from different surveys, um, namely Apogee has played a huge role in this, um, that the close, fraction, or the close binary fraction of solar type stars is very strongly anti-correlated with metallicity. Um, and what that means is that at lower metallicities, you are much more likely to form a close binary than you are at higher metallicities. Um, because sun-like stars and specifically close binaries containing sun-like stars are the progenitors of double white dwarfs that Lisa will observe. We thought that this was quite a very exciting um, opportunity to see what some observations that are actually like real empirical defined, there isn't uncertainties. Um, let's see how those propagate into our models for 
um, what Lisa will predict, which are indeed quite uncertain. So this result, uh, what it actually means for the initial binary parameters is that um, a metallicity dependent closed binary fraction effectively just alters the initial orbital period distribution of the zero age main sequence uh, progenitors of double white dwarfs. So what I'm showing here on the left is the actual, this is called the um, orbital period frequency. So the frequency of companions in closed binaries as a function of the orbital period, this is fitted exactly from this curve. Um, and the way to understand this is that at lower metallicity, so this is an Fe on H of minus 2.3, you have a much higher frequency of closed binaries, whereas at high metallicities, you have a lower fraction um, of closed binaries. And the way to translate between these two curves is that the integration of this curve up to 10 to the 4 days is the closed binary fraction in total. Um, what that means when you actually propagate that through into our binary population synthesis codes is that a metallicity dependent binary fraction, which is shown in the curves here in this um, figure, the colored curves, leads to a much wider on average initial distribution when compared to initially log uniform orbital periods at zero age mean sequence. The reason that this is quite important and interesting is because most studies have assumed this log uniform orbital period distribution. And so indeed, um, there's quite a difference here. And importantly, this effect of a more wide orbital period distribution at zero age mean sequence on average is mostly uh, affecting the solar metallicity zero age mean sequence population. Why do we care about that? Well, we think that the majority of star formation, indeed, if you believe M12i is like the true Milky Way, which is maybe not such a great assumption to make, but broadly speaking, we think a lot of the star formation in our galaxy has primarily formed at or near solar metallicity. So if you um, consider the effects of this initial orbital period distribution being on average wider than what we previously assumed, and you combine that with this competing effect that the majority of star formation is at solar metallicities, that could uh, sub significantly affect our double white dwarf population that we think Lisa will observe. Um, so we've uh, combined both of these effects with um, our binary population synthesis code, COSMIC, which is a code that I developed during my thesis. Um, and yeah, I won't go too much into detail on COSMIC. If you have questions about it, do ask. Um, I'm happy to talk to anyone and everyone about it, but we do have documentation for you to check out as well if you don't want, want to talk to me <laughs> directly, which maybe the docs will be uh, more fun. Um, so we use COSMIC to simulate the double white dwarf population to convolve in um, different binary evolution models with these um, initial orbital period assumptions and star formation history assumptions. And our models that we picked um, start out with a fiducial model, which the formation scenario broadly for our double white dwarfs that are going to make it into the Lisa band are you start out on the zero age main sequence. The first mo uh, more massive star evolves off of its main sequence, goes into a common envelope, uh, leaves behind a strip star and a main sequence star. That main sequence star evolves off of its main sequence, goes into a common envelope itself, and leaves behind a close double white dwarf. Um, in our fiducial model, we assume the standard alpha common envelope prescription that many people do uh, in these types of studies, and we assume that alpha is one here. So that means that the orbital energy going into this common envelope is exactly uh, converted into some magical energy that is going to unbind this envelope at an efficiency of one. We consider a much less, less efficient common envelope prescription. So it's the same type of idea here. Again, you have zero age mean sequence stars, a common envelope, a strip star plus a um, white dwarf, and then a common envelope again. But the difference in this alpha 25 model is that alpha is 0.25. So instead of being um, perfectly converting orbital energy into unbinding your envelope, you have to put in four times the amount of orbital energy to unbind that envelope at the same rate as our fiducial model. What that effectively leads to is many, many pre-double white dwarf formation stellar mergers. So alpha 2.5 is going to produce significantly fewer double white dwarf binaries compared to our fiducial model. On the other end, we do a very efficient unbinding uh, model, where here we set alpha to five, 
And same idea, except alpha of five is actually going to allow many, many more double white dwarfs to survive because there are very few mergers that happen inside of the common envelope. Um, as a completely different way to study this, we also considered a model where instead of assuming that this primary star goes into a common envelope first, we assume that that mass transfer remains stable. This ends up producing a little bit wider of a system here and then going into a common envelope and again producing a bit wider double white dwarfs and also leading to much fewer mergers. Um, for the gamma alpha aficionados, our Q3 model is kind of like basically the same thing as a gamma alpha here because this stable mass transfer leads to less shrinkage than a standard alpha um, common envelope would lead to. So we combine all of these models with our initial orbital period distribution that is metallicity dependent and assign ages and metallicities based on the latte suite. Um, and then because of that, or looking at that interplay, we can actually count, I don't think that you need to look very much in detail, you can definitely check this out on the paper, but the point is, is that the interplay between our binary evolution models, which are the different rows that I'm showing here, so this is our fiducial, alpha 2.5, alpha 5, and Q3, that interplays very strongly with the initial metallicity dependent uh, zero H main sequence conditions, and therefore changes quite significantly the number of double white dwarfs formed per unit solar metallic or per unit solar mass as a function of metallicity. Um, and specifically, you can see some pretty significant differences, for example, between our fiducial model for helium plus helium white dwarfs, where we really carve out a significant portion of our helium plus helium um, progenitors because they merge during common envelopes. Um, you can indeed dig through all of our data and understand all of the reasons for all of these different trends, but of course, I don't have time for that. Um, instead, we can jump straight to what the LISA population looks like. So we can count up um, all of the sources that have gravitational wave frequencies that exist in the LISA band as a function of their metallicity by assigning the ages and positions and metallicities based on galaxy M12i, as I discussed. And what we can see here is that um, in our model, sorry, I haven't, ooh, I haven't told you, uh-oh, it's the end of the day, what F50 is. F50 is just comparing what a standard uh, model would be, so assuming a 50% flat binary fraction with a flat uniform distribution. Um, and so importantly here, what's uh, what I want to point out is that because LISA is sensitive to mostly very initially short orbital periods, what we end up seeing is that in almost all cases, uh, the our original models predict many more double white dwarfs than uh, our updated models with this metallicity dependent binary fraction. One thing that I want to highlight is that the models where we have a fair amount of stellar mergers or double white dwarf progenitor mergers, we don't see as big of a difference between the um, metallicity dependent binary fraction and the log uniform um, assumptions. And that's just because there are so many mergers that it washes out any of the differences here. Once we have our cataloged sources, we can, of course, I'm going to advertise, calculate their LISA sensitivity. Tom and I have been all over the place advertising legwork because we really, really, really want to help people do these calculations simply and easily. We've uh, banged our head on it enough times that we want nobody to ever bang their head on it again. Um, so we can use legwork to count up uh, the power spectral density in LISA for all of our different models. And the thing that really stands out here is that the effects of a metallicity dependent binary fraction are much more obvious uh, in populations like Q3 and alpha 5, which are not dominated by the mergers of double white dwarf progenitors. Indeed, in those particular populations, we see a reduction in the height of the double white dwarf foreground that's quite significant. In our other models, which are more dominated by mergers of double white dwarf progenitors, we don't see too much of a difference. Um, we can kind of like highlight these differences quite a bit more by just looking at confusion fits here for our different models. And what I'm showing here in the bottom is the ratio between the number of sources in LISA uh, based on our metallicity dependent binary fraction and a flat 50% binary fraction, flat uniform distribution. And you can see um, in our different models, this is alpha 2.5, our fiducial and our Q3 and alpha 5 models, as you increase the number of sources, you're going to see a larger reduction due to this um, initial 
uh, orbital period distribution implied by the metallicity dependent binary fraction. One thing that I really want to highlight um, finally is just that, uh, and Tom Wag talked about this a little bit in the first session. Um, one thing that I want people to take away very seriously is that the number of Lisa double white dwarfs that we predict from our models varies by more than two orders of magnitude with different Roche overflow assumptions. And so since we don't know exactly what the um, true case is for these Roche overflow interactions, we don't know if alpha 2,5 or the fiducial model or alpha of 5 or Q3, we don't know which one is correct, and these are going to predict very, very different results. So if you are running binary population synthesis um, simulations, I really highly encourage you uh, to run lots of models, really explore that parameter space, because if we know what our uncertainties are, we can use LISA to help us in the future. Um, and with that, I'll just finish on a few punchlines. So first, we know that zero-age main sequence binaries have metallicity-dependent features, and we have shown in our uh, in our study that it could really seriously impact the formation of double white dwarfs that are observable by LISA. Um, we find that the double white dwarf foreground is reduced for binary evolution models, which produce large double white dwarf populations. Um, we also find that the double white dwarf foreground ends up being rather unchanged for binary evolution models, which produce smaller populations. Um, and finally, I will highlight that we are putting all of our data, all of the results, all of the code uh, used to produce our paper um, in a GitHub repository using Show Your Work. I'm happy to talk to folks about that if you're interested in it. Um, but at present, I'm not advertising our GitHub because our Show Your Work uh, install right now is totally busted. So check back later what, for when that's not um, totally broke. And yeah, that's all I have. Thank you, Katis. And uh, there is time for a question. Uh, the first came from the Gleesis element. Please, thank you. I was actually close, but I do have a question. So <laughs> and does, my, does my sound work now? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, great. All right. That was uh, very nice. Thank you. Um, one question is, um, have you looked in any way how uh, these different models compare to uh, the observed sample of double white dwarfs? Because, of course, you know, in, in a way, we're sort of reverse engineering partly because some of the, the work we've done in the past is quite heavily based on these observations. So... I yeah, think that would yeah. Be... yeah, I totally agree. So we um we have not taken the um we've not taken our results and placed them in context of EM results yet, but that is something that's basically right next on our to-do list because we have all of the data. We just need to instead of use lead work to determine the gravitational wave signatures, we need to see what um how they will show up in surveys like Gaia. Um and yeah, the ELM survey specifically. So that's that's on our docket to do now that we have all these data sets. <laughs> okay, um, thank you, Greece. Um, and the next question came from Tyson. Please unmute yourself. Yeah, when you say the double white dwarf foreground, is this after you have stripped off what you think will be resolved? Or is this the entire yes. population in the region? It's well, okay, so it's both. <laughs> Let's say that. Um, so uh, the way that we're hacking, we hack the foreground, Tyson, you'd probably um, become nauseous again <laughs> based on this, but uh, we hack our foreground by uh, doing a running median through the PSD. So that's that's how we get our foreground here. Um, we tested to see whether that's a terrible, terrible hack by doing a calculate this SNR, remove them from the PSD, calculate the SNR again, remove everything that's SNR of seven. And like when we do that, we get something that's very, very similar to um, just running a median. 
but that's our height of the foreground is what we mean uh, when we're, that's what we mean when we're saying foreground. Yeah, thank you. Is, uh, super interesting. I could not hear. So yeah, I think I missed. Uh, so Sorry. The, uh, go ahead, Tyson. So I, I was just saying that the, the number of resolvable binaries is also particularly interesting. And oh, depending yeah. on how um, densely packed they are per frequency bin, just because the, the confusion noise level goes up or down does not necessarily, okay, here. Yes, we agree. <laughs> so we, um, the way that we, Actually, no, now, well, okay, so we calculated, what we do is we calculate the, um, we calculate our running median and add that to our SNR. And then for all of our resolved systems, it's the ones that sit above that running median. I feel like we have a terrible delay, Tyson, and it's really stressing me out. I hope that I'm not <laughs> over top, like, talking over you. <laughs> I think Tyson was rather um, quick to mute himself and, and cut himself off, but I don't think there's any miscommunication. Yeah, a okay, follow up <laughs> offline would be ideal. Okay, and, and, and the next question can ask Alessandra, please unmute and ask question. Great talk, Katie. Um, so as somebody who's interested in going the other way and taking the foreground signal and trying to learn about the galaxy, right, how unique do you think that the shift is, right? Is it's going to end up being super degenerate with just the mass of the Milky Way? Or do you think that if I had a spectrum, I could actually try to go and figure out what the, uh, the metallicity of the population is? Yeah, uh, that's a fun question. I think it's quite, I think in order to back out the star formation history and like specifically like metallicity distribution, all of that, mm -hmm. it really depends on whether or not we figure out what the right binary evolution model is. Because if I think that um, once we figure out that, <laughs> then it's much, much, much easier to then say, okay, if we understand the binary evolution, you can absolutely model the hell out of the star formation history. So I think I think that that's possible and I'm I'm fairly optimistic about it um, because let's see. One of the things that I've been thinking a lot about here but haven't didn't talk about at all is that there aren't we don't just have to think about this end state. We can think about lots and lots of states. So this particular so part of this study is kind of driven by the fact that we actually have nailed the zero joint sequence population down quite well. Mm -hmm. um, there is an increasing number of white dwarf plus main sequence binaries, and there's going to be an even bigger number of these things when people pull out a really lovely data set that they can probably get in Gaia. So we're about to have in the next few years, fantastic data sets to compare intermediate phases to. And I think that that's going to be like totally revolutionary in terms of being able to determine whether this model or this model or this model or this model or somebody else's model is much more reasonable than the others. So I'm optimistic that on like 10 year time scales, we can probably get a handle on these uh, models much better than uh, the cartoons that I'm drawing on the, <laughs> on the screen right now. <laughs> All right, that's really exciting, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Katis, I have a question. So far, do you have a far model here? So what is the difference between the first three one and the last one? Yeah, so the big the biggest difference between these models basically dry are uh, producing double white dwarfs mostly through two common envelope phases. So there's always going to be a common envelope from the primary and a common envelope from the secondary. This uh, model assumption changes the physics that determines whether you go into a stable Roche overflow instead uh, rather than a common envelope here. And so we find that the majority of our double white dwarfs form through a stable mass transfer and then a common envelope. Okay, so so what is the, um, what is the main physics you push in the model Q3? The difference, yeah, so the main physics is just whether or not that there is this stable mass transfer versus the common envelope. Oh, so, so, and, so. And, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. 
uh, yeah, so the stable and then the stable mass transfer tends to result in overall wider post mass transfer systems than um, a post common envelope system. Okay, thank you. And I'm, I'm interested in the compact cause, mm, the cause that you in, mentioned. Yeah, yeah, in cosmic, yeah. Uh, uh, cosmic, yeah, cosmic. <laughs> so, um, so, so, uh, but it so you uh, because I saw you say something related to it here. Um, yeah, like um, is that the open course and yeah, yeah. So this is cosmic is totally fully developed on GitHub. Um, you can see all of our um late night <laughs> upset commits that may or the codes are broken and whatever. We do everything totally openly. Everyone can see everything. Um. Yeah, it's all, you can check out our GitHub. Um, if you search Cosmic Popsynth, we didn't think about the fact that if you name a code Cosmic in the field of astronomy, that it will become impossible to Google immediately <laughs> when we first named it. So Google Cosmic Popsynth and it will come up. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you. So if you have any question, can I follow up with you? Yeah, definitely, yeah. Thank you. Um, so I don't see any question in the chat, and also I don't see any hands up here. Okay, so uh, let's thank to the Katis and uh, yeah, it's very interesting talk about the metallicities and quite and so we um. Oh, should ha did I have a hands up? Yeah. Okay, no. Uh, so, um, yeah, uh, let's uh, thank Kathy. And uh, one more time, we would like to thank all the speaker today. And uh, today we, we have a sixth speaker talk about the detectable for binary black hole, binary um neutron star by the uh, black hole neutron star and also is interesting about the stellar origin black hole by the with lisa uh and you also learn about the observational from the galactic by the la Magellan Lang clouds with the new perspective from the lisa and also metallicity abundant to study double quadro formation. So we go from the observation <laughs> talk and simulation talk and so so it's it's uh, it's very interesting for the our session today. Um yeah so if you have any question for the own speaker I think most speakers seen here uh, please uh, go ahead and if not, yeah, we, we, we think that uh, we can follow up with, with the speaker if kind of offline discussion. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, Alada Taylor, do you have anything that you want to have? No, yeah. no, no Lan, that's, uh, I, think, I think everything's been covered. Um, I mean, if people want an easy way to follow up with their speakers, they can use the, the chat on the conference and they can also use the conference to find other people. But no, thank you for uh, sharing and, and thank you all the speakers again. Okay, and um, thank you. And uh, yeah, you have a good day. Uh, have a nice day. Yeah.